chaired this session today. I just want to very quickly frame the situation around housing in Ireland before uh, we go over to our, uh, our panel of speakers. Um, and it's stated within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care and necessary social services. And I think that's really at the core of what we're going to be discussing today because housing is very much a human rights issue. Every citizen should have the right to a home and the basic dignity that comes with that. Um, I suppose just to very quickly talk about the current situation that we find ourselves in in Ireland uh, around homelessness. The most recent figures in September showed that 4,283 adults find themselves living in emergency accommodation. That includes 1,173 families, the first time the figures have gone over 1,000, and 2,426 children. I think we'd all agree that in any civilized society, those figures are completely unacceptable. The rental figures, in terms of the issues facing anyone who's renting within the Irish rental market, uh, it's a situation of unaffordable rents, insecure tenancies, and the constant threat of eviction from the home. The most recent DAF.ie uh, figures again show that we're record breakers in a way that we really don't want to be, with increases of rents of 11.7% over the last year, the highest figures on record since DAF.ie started to compile them. My generation is very much one that is unsure if we'll ever be able to afford to own uh, or to buy a home, and also unsure as to whether we're going to be able to live in a secure, affordable way within the Irish rental market, given how chaotic it is. It seems that housing, like health, which we discussed before the break, is in a state of never-ending crisis. And too often, the shameful figures that I just talked about, I think almost as a society, it's been going on for so long that we don't actually connect with what that means for, for real people. A couple of years ago, when Jonathan Corry died outside uh, Leinster House, I think it really hit home the human nature of the homelessness crisis. And I think it's all, all too worrying now that it's almost become embedded within our discourse now that this type of level of, of homelessness on this scale is just a part of the way things are in Ireland of 2016. Someone made a point at a renter's meeting I was at the other day that this is not a crisis that we face. Um, that the ap approach to our housing market reflects our ideology and reflects our policy choices. And I suppose just to say that I think there's a real moral need to address the massive homelessness crisis we have in the country. There's a social need to address the impacts on people's living standards that rising rents are having. And then there's an economic need that the longer this goes on, the less money people will have in their pockets in terms of disposable income to spend in local businesses and to spend in the local economy. So this session is very important and it's going to look at what measures are needed to tackle homelessness, increase the supply of quality affordable housing and to address the crisis of escalating rents. And in particular our three speakers are going to touch on the following three questions. How can we bring down the cost of building new homes? How best can we ensure rent security? And how can we improve the planning system to make it more responsive to housing need but to still retain a save for the public? So I'm delighted to be able to introduce our first speaker, uh, Sarah Jane Henley. Sarah Jane contested the 2016 elections for the Social Democrats in Limerick City, and she works in community development, providing advice and support to community groups and refugees. Sarah Jane. Can you stand up? Either, you can do, you can do it from there or, or the podium. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Jane Henley. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really honoured to be part of this panel. Um, I suppose with the, probably the foremost parliamentarian on housing issues and a uh, renowned um, expert and thinker in the area. I did wonder when I was written ready for this, what can I bring or what perspective can I bring that might be different to the two people sitting beside me. Um, I come from Limerick City and I suppose Limerick has a very uh, interest in history and current situation, I suppose, around housing and, and housing provision. Um, in, as Joe said, in 2016, I stood in the general elections. I also stood in the local elections for Limerick, and I work in the community. And I, as a result, feel as though I have a kind of a fairly decent handle on what people think and how people feel in relation to this issue. Um, and I found that, I suppose, specifically during the generals, you know, I would have knocked on about 20,000 doors and varying degrees of kind of social, economic disadvantage, um, wealth, etc. 
And there's two types of attitudes. The first one is a kind of a begrudging attitude towards people who get social housing, whether it's somebody who's in the queue, of which there are 5,000 people in Limerick City and County waiting for social housing, whether it's somebody that's looking at a house and then it's given to someone else, then they make the, li the person's life difficult because they want that house. So there's a divisive kind of culture around the, li the waiting list and the way people are made kind of queue up um, at the mercy of the local authority and government policy. And the second is a kind of a questioning, a general questioning of whether or not government should actually provide um, social housing and rent certainty and all the different policy initiatives that a government should do. And as social democrats, we all agree that there, there should be a sustainable and prescriptive approach to social housing provision. So I found that that's really the two predominant cultures that I experienced meeting people in Limerick City. And um, I think it is as a result of government policy as it currently stands, where there's been a kind of a suffocation of kind of provision of resources and strategic thinking around how you provide social housing and kind of secure housing stock for people. Um, and as a result, and I think the intention of that is to make people think, well, maybe it isn't the role of a government to do that. And then as a result, government can wash its hands of that particular um, duty. Um, and I think that's why this culture and this narrative is becoming so prominent. I know in my own city, that's, that's what I've experienced. And I suppose with Limerick, it's actually really interesting, the history of uh, social housing. In the 60s, they would have built Moy Ross and South Hill, um, which are fully social housing. They're not mixed. There's no private tenants there. And they were built in what can only be described as a cul-de-sac. Um, and it was ultimately ghettoized. Um, many people in this room might know um, huge problems with antisocial behavior and crime, social exclusion, generational unemployment, uh, low educational levels. And it represented a huge uh, kind of disadvantage, uh, inequality in Limerick City, and a major issue that we had to tackle. Um, so in the early 2000s, um, it, the second biggest regeneration project in the country took place in Limerick. Huge amounts of investment, a lot of goodwill, big plans. Um, and we had a dual approach. It was kind of, I suppose, a hard measures, which was increase infrastructure, knock down social housing and rebuild in new areas and cr create a mix between private and social. And then had the soft measures, which was educational interve interventions to try and break that generational cycle of disadvantage and unemployment. And by and large, although it is a huge undertaking and you can never make sure that everybody would be happy, it hasn't delivered, and um, there's been a lot of money invested and people don't know where it went. A lot of houses demolished, people misplaced, and real social upheaval in the city. Um, and the key message I get from talking to people in Limerick is they had no interest in anything but a roof over their heads and the security that they were promised from the very outset by the likes of John Fitzgerald, who wrote the Fitzgerald Report, and other people that came after him involved in regeneration. So I suppose that's kind of where we're at, and that's kind of my experience in terms of people's attitudes towards social, social housing and the impact that it can have in terms of the dark history that Limerick had in relation to crime and antisocial behaviour because of the way social housing was planned and delivered in Limerick. And I suppose coming up to the current day in Limerick, there are 217 people homeless, 62 of those are um, children, um, which is a huge, huge increase on the numbers in Limerick. And there's a local a housing charity, Novus Initiatives, which has reported a 400% increase in referrals in this first quarter. Um, and last week, we lost a young woman who was 31 years of age. She was sleeping rough in Limerick. That night, she'd been refused from a hostel, and she had previously been under a tenant scheme with Novus Initiatives. Novus is, um, also works with people with drug and alcohol addiction and mental health difficulties. This lady had mental health difficulties and drug and alcohol problems. And she was evicted from her house because she was unable to keep up at rents. And that was a, a, a clause that was brought in by a senior member of staff in Novus Initiatives in order to make sure that there will be constant revenue stream from their service users, which is inherently, um, it lacks compassion, it lacks understanding of the kind of people that were seeking the services. Um, but by and large, Novus Initiatives do great work and they do have a kind of a fully fledged strategy for people. And I think the thing I'm going to summarise with my understanding of in terms of housing and affordable housing and all that is that it is such a multifaceted issue. We need to look at rent certainty. We need to look at our attitude towards property ownership. We need to look at uh, 
why the political establishment refuses to tackle landlords and speculative owners and we also need to look at the crossover between mental health difficulties and drug and alcohol addiction and homelessness of which there is a huge overlap. There was a study done by Trinity and the University of Limerick and they surveyed the homeless population between Limerick and Dublin which is a very difficult thing to do as they're obviously uh, quite difficult to source and to keep track of. And they found that almost 45% of people who were homeless had also dual, been dual diagnosed with either drug and alcohol addiction or some kind of a mental health difficulty with schizophrenia or something like that. So we really need to kind of interloop all of these issues together along with the more heavy hard and policy things and also looking at why the establishment is not willing to really tackle this issue at a high level. People who are making profit out of it. Um, so that's, that's really all for me. I look forward to hearing from the other speakers and um, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Sarah Jane. Um, delighted now to hand over to our next speaker, PJ Drudy. PJ is an Emeritus Professor of Economics and Director of the Centre of Urban and Regional Studies at Trinity College Dublin. He's published numerous papers and books, including Ireland, Land, Politics and People, Ireland and the European Community, The Irish in America, Ireland and Britain since 1922, and also, importantly, Out of Reach, Inequality in the Irish Housing System, where he predicted the Irish housing crash as far back as 2005. So uh, I'd like to ask PJ to, to speak now. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, um, Connor, and... Um, Thank you, Roisin and uh, Catherine, for asking me. I'm always delighted to get the chance. And uh, it is a very complex topic, as uh, our previous speaker has said. Uh, I've called the thing here, the housing crisis in Ireland, the case for a new philosophy. And really, that is the starting point, as far as I'm concerned, that the questions to ask ourselves is, what kind of society do we actually want? What kind of a housing system do we want? They're the two fundamental questions I would say to ask. Uh, is housing a commodity, as it has become, or for speculation, for capital gains, for wealth creation, or is it a home? Is it a right, as uh, Joe first said? So th they're the starting point, philosophy. If you haven't a philosophy, Forget it. Go home. And I, I think that's the, 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 the starting point for all of us. Now, there are three basic problems in the housing situation in Ireland. First of all, escalating house prices, uh, escalating rents, insecurity of tenure, and poor standards, and significant housing needs. They are the three things, really. Escalating house prices, rents in the same category, as has been said early, uh, a moment ago, and um, housing need. Large numbers of people, 100,000 families close to it, around 300,000 people without housing in unsatisfactory situation. Another starting point is to look at the figures. And what you find is that in 1975, 33% of our homes were for non-profit, produced by local authorities, county councils. And today, only 4% are constructed by local authorities. That's an appallingly bad record. So what has happened over that 30 years is that housing has been co become commodified or marketized. It's market-driven, driven by the private sector. They are now being relied on to produce housing. And of course, as a result, you have escalating prices and you have profit as the main motive, which is not quite appropriate, I would say, for housing. And the market has failed. Very few economists admit that, but markets fail all the time. Housing provision entirely dependent on this market, and yet, think about it, go back to 2006, Private developers produced something like 90,000 homes. And in 2016, they produced 12,000 homes at a time when there was massive demand for homes. So the market has failed to deliver. It's as simple as that. Access to a home, whether to buy or to rent, depends on having money. 
If you have no money, you don't get a home. Now, I've done a few interesting diagrams over the years in relation to house prices. And if you look at house prices around 1991, starting off there, quite low. And by 2007, it was up there. And the consumer price index went like this, straight across. And the cost of construction went like that, straight across, 2 or 3% per annum. And average earnings went like that. But house prices were up there. Of course, they came down for a while, a few years. The consumer price index and remained exactly the same. Now they're on the way up again, like that. They're escalating again. And they're very, very close to what they were at the peak in 2007. Now, what I suggest to you, as a result of, I have a diagram here, but I obviously can't show it to you because I didn't want to waste your time uh, on PowerPoints. But really, I'm suggesting to you that housing is vastly overpriced. Overpriced. Far too expensive. Completely out of line with normal indicators like the consumer price index or the average earnings or construction costs. Construction costs rose by about 100% in the period from 1991 up to the present time. Housing prices rose by about 500%. Now that, to my mind, is wrong, and it should not happen. The ratio of incomes to house prices were around 4 to 1 in 1984, and in 1994, in Dublin now, they are 11 to 1. 11 to 1. So young people cannot possibly purchase a home, or not so young people cannot purchase a home. These are the realities, and they're, there's a real problem. So that's house prices. Rents, well, escalating rents, inadequate regulation, virtually no regulation, insecurity of tenure, poor standards. Yes, 5.6 billion has been handed out to landlords over the past 15 years in rent supplement. I think that's appalling. That would have built 30,000 homes. Foreign vulture funds, 5,000 homes have been sold off by NAMA to vulture funds over the last few years. Uh, heavy lobbying by these vulture funds of ministers, heavy lobbying by some Irish landlords, of course, too, saying, leave matters to the market, don't interfere, don't have rent regulation, as Joe was suggesting. Uh, Kennedy Wilson, you may have heard of them. They wrote a very long letter to the Minister for Finance in October last. And they said to Noonan and the rest of them, for God's sake, don't interfere with rents, don't have rent certainty, don't regulate rents, because if you do, the world is going to come to an end. We'll have mass unemployment. Landlords will exit the sector in droves. You'll have none of us left. And of course, it's a major disincentive if you do that to us important people from foreign investment uh, circles. And there's another crowd called uh, Iris Wright, R-E-I-T. A man called Ehrlich was on the paper yesterday. And he said, it's a great market. We've never seen rental increases like this in any jurisdiction that we're aware of. That was in yesterday's Irish Times. And then he went on to say that he was deeply sorry for the Irish people who had to pay high rents. Honestly, think about these guys. They're unbelievable. So, you know, are we going to do anything about them or not, is the question. So why no rent regulation? It's because of people like that who have enormous influence on successive Irish governments, and particularly on the present one. And I think it's a shame. So the government policy, of course, they did try. In fairness to Kelly, the last minister, Alan Kelly, did try to regulate rents in line with what is happening in European countries. But in fact, a compromise solution was reached where they would 
uh, regulate rents every two years. I mean, or stop, you know. So in two years' time, a landlord could put up his rents by 50% instead of his usual 20%. So that hasn't worked. Now, there's this debate, and you must stop me. I realize my time is short, so you stop me now at any time. <laughs> rent control and rent regulation. People are constantly giving out about rent control. It doesn't exist. Rent control no longer exists. That was a sort of a cap on rents. That is gone. It was rendered unconstitutional, in fact, in 1981. But rent regulation is the norm throughout Europe. Rent regulation would allow rents to increase by a few percent per annum. That's the situation in Germany and France and Switzerland and Sweden, all over the place. The Europeans are doing it, but somehow or other, we can't even consider it. I noticed Mr. Coveney several times recently has said he doesn't want to contemplate rent certainty for tenants. I think that's a shame. Uh, it really is essential that we talk in terms of rent regulation. So it's not a cap. It's a reasonable percentage to allow landlords to improve their premises or whatever. But it would not allow 10% or 20% per annum completely out of line with the consumer price index or with other reasonable indicators. So that's very, very important. And I think there's an economic case for rent regulation because the basic situation, it's not a normal free market, the, the landlord situation. It's a monopolistic type market where you have small numbers of landlords and huge numbers of tenants. That's monopoly effectively. And it's accepted widely all over the world that if you have a monopoly situation, governments intervene. So there's no case for not intervening. But the other major problem is that if you have high rents or high house prices, then it's bad for the economy because money has, been, has to be spent on housing, which could be spent otherwise on employment creation. So it's bad for the economy. And rent increases out of line with indicators such as inflation are just not, not justified. That's the second sector. The third problem I mentioned was housing need. And that has escalated from around 28,000 families in 1993 to 89,000 today. It possibly could be more, but that's the last estimate we have. That's about 300,000 people in housing need. Something radically wrong with that. All sorts of, the housing list, evicted tenants, of course, it's a big issue. Mothers, fathers, children, single individuals, individuals suffering addiction, people with disabilities. I could give you one simple figure from my own experience in recent times, I'm embroiled with disability issues in the Don Leary area. Not a single bed space has been provided or funded by the government in Don Leary over the last 10 years. And I'm talking about a bed space, I'm not talking about housing. A bed for people with intellectual disabilities. I think it's an area that the Social Democrats should look at. Now, What's the situation? The housing plan of 2016. Mr. Coveney suggests he will have 47,000 social housing units. It's unclear how that will be done. It's not clear at all that he will build them all. He says he will buy some of them. And I would suggest that buying homes by the government is simply in competition with young people who are also trying to buy. It would be far better to construct. 75,000 units to be got via the private rental sector. I would abandon that altogether personally because I think the private rented sector is not fit for purpose. It's not, hasn't done the job. It's evicting tenants, the standards are poor, and there's insecurity of tenure. So unless we have major changes in the private rented sector in relation to rent regulation, standards, and security of tenure, I would not trust that sector to deliver for social needs. It is not suitable in my view. So the ver I finish uh, now, uh, key principles. There are a number of principles I think are critical. First of all, housing should be treated as a public good rather than a commodity for trading, for capital gains or whatever. Everyone should have the right to affordable housing appropriate to need. And I would enshrine that right in legislation and are in the Constitution. Thirdly, government strategy is essential for land acquisition. 
We should not be flogging off land, we should be purchasing it because it is a critical element and we should be purchasing it, by the way, at existing use value plus compensation. I'd go back to the Kenny report in 1973, something like that. Now, last act lastly, what sort of actions? Well, I would think it would be worth establishing a housing authority on the lines of the housing executive in Northern Ireland, which was very, very successful. And it could build on the existing housing agency. I would have to take action to bring down house prices. I think we'll talk about it later because I won't have time now. I would introduce rent regulation on European lines. I would build at least 10,000 local authority homes per annum. And I would have, lastly, a cost rental situation. I would believe that the government should establish a new cost rental, what I would call community housing tenure, for those ineligible for local authority housing, but perhaps able to pay a reasonable economic rent, but a controlled rent. The guard, the teacher, the professor, the politician, whoever. And really, that would be in competition then with the private sector, private landlords, as well as, of course, private housing to purchase. And people, if they had a secure private rental situation at a reasonable cost with perfectly good standards, they would not be so desperate to buy houses. So thank you very much. That's about all I have to say. Uh, thanks very much, PJ. I think we'll all agree that was a fantastic summation of the, the different challenges and also some of the solutions um, for the housing market in Ireland. So before we open it up to the, the audience, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker, uh, who I'm, I'm sure most of you will know very well. It's the Joint Leader of the Social Democrats, Catherine Murphy, TD. Thanks very much. Well, just didn't that make sense? You know, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, we've got almost conditioned to talking about things differently. And that's part of a philosophy that we've been kind of forced into. People are talked, talking about, they're, they're, they're being talked into thinking about getting their foot on the property ladder, when in fact it's a home they're looking to provide. You know, it's talked about as an investment opportunity. You know, there's a radically different response if you're looking uh, if you're looking at delivering a home for people as opposed to a foot on the property ladder. It's about somebody else doing it. It's about something that is removed, if you like, from the state where the state has to have um, a, a role. And that doesn't mean people can't buy houses, um, but it does mean that there's got to be a mixture. And there's got to be that choice and public policy should be neutral at the very least one of the things and just to pick up a point in relation to a housing agency um, it was one of the things that we had in our manifesto that we thought there was a need for a housing delivery agency perhaps taking the housing agency as it exists at the moment and you know the statistical side of another agency and there's there's a whole delivery piece there that's missing and if there was real intent, that delivery piece would be there. It looks like there's crazy stuff like, for example, there's no organisation in this country that actually, in, in one place, uh, looks at where land is owned by the state, uh, where they would be, have responsibility for that land bank. Um, and, you know, and then maybe acquiring further land. Um, I'm a particular fan of the Kenny report, I've got to say, I think, uh, the notion that uh, that land uh, transferred for vast sums of money and made a small fortune for a very small sector of Irish society. And at the same time, people have been paying that through their lifetime in mortgage payments. Um, they've been paying that cost, if you like. Um, and that, uh, that, you know, that is part of that, that philosophy. Um, the, just to move on slightly onto the point that Sarah Jane was making there, there's kind of a new type of homelessness, but there is a, uh, there is, there is, we, we've, we've adopted the housing fair first approach in relation to, to housing for people who have um, uh, particular difficulties, may well have an addiction problem or mental health problems. 
you know, if you don't if you don't deal with the chaos, you won't actually deal with the other um, issues. And that is part of the reason why that makes very good public policy. Um, but they, I, for the last five or six years, I've found that the number one issue that people will come into me in my constituency ops and talk about is um, uh, homelessness or the risk of losing their home. And it's out of this chaotic market that has been, had so much money, um, you know, public money, uh, go into it in subventing um, uh, the, um, the the cost of rents, um, and they'll come in and they'll say, typically say, I never thought this could happen to me. Um, these are people are in the private rented sector. There's a shortage now, and rents are go going up because more can be got f from the sector. Um, and it's it's not about somebody living in what they would describe as a home. They're living in somebody else's property. And we really do need to, uh, to, to, to get to grips with that. Um, obviously, things won't happen. Uh, there's, it's going to take time to uh, more or less develop a, a policy um, or a set of policies, but it's going to take time to deliver uh, solutions as well. But there are things that could be done. Uh, certainly, that land bank is one of the things. Um, there are things like, for example, there's something like 200,000 um, uh, vacant properties according to the last census of population. We've got to find ways of, and there may well be some fiscal measures, there may well be measures with a sunset clause that you can actually deal with this. But the idea that you will not tackle something or not look at that as an opportunity when you have whole families living in a, um, a hotel room or the hidden homelessness. There are people that may well, the Section 10 of the Housing Act, uh, you know, categorises as homeless because there, uh, because there is payment from that section of the Act towards the cost of the housing. But there's local authorities that won't accept um, people that are presenting as homeless. Um, they'll doubt it, and that's something that there needs to be a, um, you know, a way to uh, appeal against. Um, and um, essentially, they're people who are maybe you might find two or three families under the same roof. Um, I know it's, the term is almost called couch surfing at this stage, but that might be all right for a fortnight, you know, for one person. But when you see whole families um, living like that, existing like that, um, uh, you know, there has to be that kind of emergency response as well. And that, that is where some of that emergency uh, res response could be, uh, could, could be dealt with, because those houses are not actually in use, they're vacant. Um, they may well be owned by, by other people, it's not a perfect solution, but it may well be the kind of temporary solution that we could look at um, until, um, until we start seeing supply. We start seeing a problem in, in my particular constituency because there was a big, um, there was a big um, job hire on in, in Intel that was almost in a counter-cyclical um, kind of environment where, you know, all the jobs were being lost was four and a half thousand people being employed on a construction site and we started seeing the uh, the private rented sector anything that was available being sucked out um, and i happened to be on the housing committee in the doll and we invited in the homeless agencies the housing agency anyone we could think of uh, to, to talk about it and the one thing that was really interesting at the time was that the housing agency came in and told us that there was no shortage of money that they would be able to get money from the European Investment Bank. Um, and essentially, uh, it was a question of um, how you designed the policy so you could draw that money down. This is 2012, 2013 kind of time. Uh, we still haven't really um, gone after that. We haven't developed that al other alternative, which is like uh, tier three housing associations. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Ivy Trust over 100 years ago, um, it was, a, it was a very good model and it predated some of what the local authorities did. Uh, I think we've got to be quite imaginative from that point of view where you can have a cost rental approach uh, with a sector like that that will also make sure to mix, um, mix the, uh, uh, the people um, that are at work or people with disabilities or people who have maybe not the ability to pay, pay a lot of rent. Um, I refuse to believe that we can't um, deal with uh, deal with this issue and I refuse to believe that it has to be as slow 
as it's um, as, as it's being dealt with at the moment. And it's a slow, really, because, do you know what? I think they're taking a deep breath and they're hoping the market will sort it out. And um, I don't see uh, how... Um, I don't see how that's going to happen when there is an, an insufficiency of money for people to, to purchase. Um, and one of the other things is that um, it, we've been saying that there's ways of putting money back into people's pockets. You know, um, and the way to put money back into people's pockets is to deal with the cost of living. Things like housing, things like childcare are huge costs. And unless you tackle those, and I heard Ashley and Neil talking about it earlier about uh, you know, nurse, nurses with um, accommodation that was tied to the employment, uh, was allowing them to move between different employments. Uh, what's, driving, what's driving demands for wage costs is people are struggling to make ends meet. And they're struggling to make ends meet because big things like housing, big things like childcare, have to be dealt with in an entirely de different way, with a different philosophy, with a philosophy about the public good and not just about uh, the, the free market. Uh, because, um, uh, I, I, I'll finish with this, I, I keep on going and reassuring some of the people in my constituency, whereas maybe unfinished estates or whatever, say, oh, we've been here before. Believe me, I've dealt with this before uh, as a public representative. Um, uh, this is my second crash as a public representative. <laughs> and, uh, it, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say that. But, you, you know, we keep doing it to ourselves. And we will do it again unless we do things differently. And that, that's a change in mindset. And it's a change in, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's a change that I think has a societal benefit in the longer term. And I think it, 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 it's actually very good for the economy as well. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, I'm sure some of the issues that have been discussed uh, resonate with an awful lot of you, and uh, we're going to now, over the next 10 or 15 minutes, try and get as many people in on this issue as possible. I'd ask people, because we are time-constrained, very time-constrained, we're all Social Democrats here, we believe in chairing, so try to keep your uh, contributions as small as possible, and we'll get as many people as possible in. So um, I'm going to start, first of all, with that gentleman down there. Yeah, with the hand up with the glasses there, yeah. Hello? Yeah, uh, how are you? Hi, uh, my name's John Bowler. Uh, I'm a stay-at-home parent in large part because I couldn't get a job that would cover the cost of childcare. Um, I had a couple of things I wanted to say. Uh, one was, I've heard a number of people talking about not treating housing as a commodity but in the housing document that's out on the tables out there, it uses the term starter home several times. And I was surprised and disappointed to see that because I think it's a, uh, a phrase that's very much part of the kind of the property supplement hysteria, the getting your foot on the property ladder uh, idea. So that was just a, a concern that I had about the, the way the, the topic was being discussed. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, uh, I know just anecdotally, uh, in Germany, lo very long-term leases are common, or so I'm told by German people, um, where you can have a home, a family home, with a, a lease of 30 or 40 years uh, that you live in as a tenant, and that it's not assumed that everyone needs to or wants to buy a house. Um, and I was wondering if that is something that we could... Um, move towards here if it's something that was possible here. Uh, so it's just a, a thing I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Good point. Good point. I want to get a gender balance on the contributions. Is there any? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Fifi Smith, North Kildare. Um, I'm a retired architect and uh, my the pattern of my employment would be quite uh, similar to many other architects. I've been made redundant three times. I should at this stage of my life be fairly comfortably off, and that's not the case, because the housing market is cyclical. And it's cyclical because the structures that we have attract a type of person who wants to make huge gains very fast and is willing to take very, very high risks. 
And the result is that of that is that we have a boom and bust uh, housing sector, which has been in operation since I left college. And nothing has changed. The whole, the, it has been copper fastened by uh, the planning laws which brought in zoning, which meant that most of the profits are made out of the rezoning, which we all know is always subject to a lot of pressure under the, under the counter, shall we say. But my appeal to, the, to, to whoever's, doing the, uh, whoever's on the committee for uh, dealing with housing is to look at the structures in terms of the kind of people that ha have always been attracted into generating the houses. And those are high risk people who will take huge risks, they have huge energy, they can be very useful to society, but they need, the, the structure needs to be changed so that you attract in people who want long, slow uh, profits, rather than these huge, big, wide gains. So I would appeal to whoever's looking at the housing in the, in the uh, Social Democrats to, um, to concentrate on the package that's been offered every, and I, I, the thing about it being cyclical, that has been documented. I'm sure the professor could tell us where those, wh wh where those studies are. But all I'm asking is to have a very close look at the type of people who are being uh, 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 brought into the private sector and try and bri bring in a much more reliable kind of investor. And just one other thing on, the minor, on a minor detail, uh, if you want to get reuse of all the boarded up shops and the shops that have no uh, use for the bits above them, uh, could you please get somebody to relook at the, the fire rating part of the building regulations, which uh, makes it prohibitively, prohibitively expensive to uh, separate a commercial pre premise and the, the rooms above it into two separate uh, housing and, um, and commercial. So. Okay. <laughs> Next here. We've got a lot of hands and very little time, so I'll try to keep everything to 30 seconds to a minute if possible. Uh, I, my name is Mark Kelly. I'm from the Dublin Ratdown Ranch. Uh, I'm a treasury manager. Uh, I welcome the comments from the uh, lecturer from Trinity. I think he was on the ball. Uh, I think in terms of the market in, and housing, the market's clearly failed us. It failed us in 2007 and it's failing us again today. We need bold strategy today to build houses. I think we should build we should start suggesting to build 100,000 houses by the government that should be sold on a cost plus basis. The government can do this cheaply, uh, uh, interest rates, they can borrow money for 30 years at less than 1%, they can, um, they can acquire land as well, as well as rezoning land, and it's clearly the government who can do this in the, in the best, best effective method. Uh, I think this is a, it's an area that affects so many people, not even, it's the middle class, it's, it's, it's everyone, it's the younger people who can't afford homes. Uh, also, our un unemployment rate is still quite high, it's still at 7%, and if we were to build these homes, it would drive down unemployment, which would be good for all of us. And as well, if people could aff have affordable homes, they'd have more money in their pocket to spend in the economy in general. It's a win-win-win all around, and we should definitely do it. <laughs> okay, next two hands is here in the front row, I'm going to take. Uh, sorry, I have the microphone. Uh, hi, my name's Aaron Bowman, I'm with the Dunleary branch and I'm also attached to the UCD branch. Uh, recently we had a housing talk in there, particularly about the crisis, where it was mentioned, and it's been mentioned a lot here about how the market has failed us, but in our talk there and increasingly in my lectures we keep hearing that actually there isn't a housing market, is it? With the market that we keep talking about doesn't function as one at all and we should really just I think stop considering it as a market and considering it a necessity that would free up especially the government from certain regulations in the EU and regulations they've imposed on themselves to intervene a lot more and actually provide these housing this housing to people we need to we need to recognize this is not a market anymore supply and demand is not lining up and there's no and over the past nearly 20 years, it hasn't hit nearly any form of equilibrium. Once we recognize that, we can actually go a lot further and begin to intervene. I think that's very important. I think something the Social Democrats should be pushing for. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Helen Cheevers. I'm with the Dublin Fingal branch of the Social Democrats, and I think I might be able to offer a temporary solution. Um, I recently um, was told by my landlord the house has gone into receivership, so I'm in a bad situation where I'm living. But um, I recently found a housing scheme which is basically set up by a not-for-profit organisation. They set this up 11 years ago. They're only able to get it off the ground now after 11 years of preparation. But basically, they're building, um, I think it's 60 houses, a quarter of which have already been built and have been given to social housing. The rest are being sold at affordable housing prices. They're being offered two to four bedroom units at a lot reduced rates compared to the current market. The houses are all being built to an A2 standard, so they're all ecologically friendly as well, which is better for the environment. And um, basically, it just means that um, the houses are being built and offered at affordable prices. Um, they did this in conjunction with uh, Dublin City Council as well, where they bought the land at a reduced price from them in agreement that there would be a clawback. So people can't sell these homes within the first 10 years, otherwise they have to pay back the cost of the site to Dublin City Council, which means it also encourages people to stay there longer and build a community with each other. And there's also a facility being put in place for the community who are going to be moving there to um, stay in contact with Dublin City Council and talk to them about facilities and amenities in the area, of which they've put aside a small budget for that as well, because there's another strip of land beside where the houses are built. And they're asking, what, do, what does the community want built here? I'm suggesting that as a short-term fix, the Social Democrats could get in touch with not-for-profit organisations doing things like this and helping them get past the hurdles that took this particular uh, group 11 years to get past between the legal side of things and just getting the land from Dublin City Council and getting the banks to agree to this. So um, that, that's my suggestion. Gentlemen here in the... Kevin? I have no shortage of takers. No. And we had two down here as well. Hello. Um, my name is David O'Reilly, Dublin Central. I moved back to D Dublin in 2013, and I remember at the time going down to Kill Economics, and they were sitting on stage, the economists and a guy from Daft, and they predi were predicting exactly what, what happened three years later. Um, you know, the numbers, the issues with people not being able to afford houses. Um, we knew about it then, and I think it's a real indictment of um, the government, obviously, that, that nothing really changed in those three years. And I've walked past vacant lots, and I've walked past, I've gone to viewings and, and seen first-time buyers being outbid by people who already have two, three homes. I think we're at the stage where we need really radical thinking um, and legislation to really um, hit people where it hurts in terms of tax and compulsory purchases, which have already been mentioned. Um, we'll probably end up like a city like San Francisco, say, where you've got tents with people living, families living on the streets, um, people just lying on the pavement, and where you can't afford, where you can't buy a one-bedroom flat for, or you can't rent a one-bedroom flat for less than three, four thousand dollars a month. Um, we're not very far off that and I just hope that Social Democrats can change it. That's why I'm here. Uh. Hi, I'm Aileen from Dublin Central as well. Um, so I think Joe touched on this very briefly at the start, but we haven't talked much about it. I'm one of the many, many people in Ireland who are in their 30s and can't see any point in the future at which they'll ever be able to buy a house or an apartment. Um, and the problem at the moment is obviously like a lot of us are paying e an equivalent amount in rent to what we'd have to pay into a mortgage. So we can afford <coughs> mortgages. We just don't have the deposit to actually buy a place in the first place. And I'm wondering what, what we can put in place to change that, to make it easier for people to get into a situation where they can buy property. There's been suggestions of like, of undoing the rule about the um, certain multiple times your salary need, that you can only borrow, but then that of course brings its own problems as well. Um, so I don't have an answer with this, I'm asking a question. What can we do to change that situation? Okay, I'm going to be the most unpopular person in the room here, but sure, I knew that before I started. We have one guy who's been waiting at the front since pretty much the start. There's a microphone at the back with two people there, and after that we're going to have to close it off and go back to the panel. 
um, because it's three o'clock now almost. So, Thanks. Uh, Kieran Nevin, Dublin Central. Um, PJ, this is, I suppose, quite a specific question, but uh, we know that the central bank over a year ago passed policies, uh, a policy in terms of limiting the amount of money that people could borrow to try and calm down the, the market. So as first of all, the question is, what's your view of that policy? And secondly, uh, it's expected that the central bank is going to water down those policies and announce that on Wednesday. What do you think of, of the potential for that and you know, questions over central banks' uh, independence? Because if it's on, the, uh, on a political backlash, um, you know, what, what, what essentially should happen? Because as I assume, as a party, we'll have to respond to whatever announcement is made. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, thank you. My name is Gareth Mullen. I'm uh, out in Balbriggan, uh, Dublin North, Fingal. And I have two points just in relation to the question around at the Irish attitude towards home ownership. And I think uh, the Professor and Catherine both kind of developed the point uh, that I kind of would make. But the policy I think we need to move towards in this country would be mixed use social housing. Because the current policy where there's 10% of X number of houses that are allocated to social housing doesn't work because 10% of 10 is one. Uh, you know, and th that, that's the numbers that, that the market is delivering at the moment. It's, it's very small numbers, and it, it's just not responding to what's needed. So the idea of mixed-use social housing, where people who are working, who are in, in jobs, who are having a decent lifestyle, but would actually choose to live in social housing because of security of tenure and a cheaper rent and uh, other flexibilities and maybe other infrastructure that would be around it, around that estate, um, and this, that could get over the problem of, what, for example, recently the councils have been trying to develop modular housing and there's been objections to that. And uh, in turn, councils kind of appealing or shaming local areas as to saying, don't you want it to help homeless people? And uh, so I, I think that the philosophy needs to be about developing social housing by choice. Uh, and that would allow the councils and uh, housing agencies to be a bit more entrepreneurial to support that and, and uh, develop that. The other uh, recommendation I would have, and I'd really like you to follow it up on the doll, and I have uh, pushed one TD in our area to ask questions around this issue, because I don't know how many of you know that uh, last year there was new legislation introduced to ban discrimination against people who are on rent allowance, and it fines are up to 15,000 euro. You might think that's very good, but it's very hard to vindicate that uh, change in legislation, vindicate your rights under that legislation. A friend of my wife's uh, is from, uh, has very little English, and she broke up from a violent relationship uh, earlier on in the year. And then the landlord uh, you know, said he wants to sell the apartment, and, uh, and uh, she had to move. And uh, she was in a very risky position, uh, very, very much at risk uh, of homelessness. And her daughter was just about to go into junior infants at the school in the local area. And like I said, very little English. And so we started looking for accommodation. Yep. And, and the problem was uh, landlords and agents not accepting rent allowance. The two bed apartment that was advertised for 900 euro uh, wouldn't accept rent allowance tenants. Then, anyway, she ended up getting a rent allowance uh, for 1,150 at the maximum for a, a single parent with a child for a one-bed apartment in Balbriggan, a, you know, a tiny apartment that would have been rented for four or 500 euro f four years ago, uh, are going at 1,250 because the new rent allowance limits have been changed. Now, that's, that's, that's the problem. The, the, the other problem is how to... Okay, uh, Gareth, we need okay, to move on. We've two, just two the people question left. is about... Um, the Workplace Relations Commission are dealing with these cases. They don't want to deal with the cases. Kieran Mulvey was opposed to that, and the government has insisted they're the ones who are responsible, but they're completely inappropriate agency to respond to it. It should be with the PRTB. Okay, the final two people with the mics are our final two speakers right, before we go to the very panel. Quick okay. question. Uh, will I go? My, I guarantee you this is quick. Okay. Um, Ashley O'Neill from Mead East, and this is a question for Mr. Drudy. Um, construction builders are saying that the increase in house prices due to the construction costs. Have we any work being done on verifying or debunking these construction costs? Thank you. And the last very quick word to this gentleman here. 
Okay, I shall uh, try to be brief. I won't go through my 17 different points that I've noted down. Uh, <laughs> my name is Kojo Slomi from Cork, North Central. I think this is actually, I feel, a really big area of opportunity for us as social democrats to differentiate ourselves in the response to what is a critical solution, uh, uh, sorry, a critical problem with interesting solutions. It's critical because actually it's about intergenerational fairness. It's pitching, in essence, the young who we've heard around this room who are struggling to get onto the ladder to, to find the, uh, the deposits against maybe those who are older and tend to vote, um, who are maybe more secure because they got in two, two booms and busts um, ago. But I think there's a lot that can be done from a policy perspective uh, on the supply side. Catherine already mentioned about bringing back house, derelict houses into use. We've already heard about uh, planning and how we can tweak the planning legislation and so on to, um, to do that. And even how we can, um, to the earlier conversation on healthcare, go back to the situation, particularly through local authority funded housing, where we go back to those types of key worker housing to say we value our nurses, our doctors, and other key public servants, and we're going to support them in critical areas. Now, I think what we also have to do is to look at the, the demand uh, side of things as well. Look at how we, you know, rent certainty is, is, a, is a given. It has to be done. It has to be done to make sure that people you know, aren't faced with 20, 30, 40% um, increases. And alongside that, we have to look at tenancy certainty as well. So you don't get the call and to say you're out of your house in, 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 in three months and look at how we can provide um, certainty and security of that. And if we can change the mindset and get away from the house ownership uh, fetish that you have to get onto the housing ladder because there are other secure alternatives um, that means you can have a home for life without having to get an unsustainable mortgage, I think it will be a better country for it. Okay, thanks to everyone that contributed from the floor. Apologies to anyone that we didn't get to. Obviously, there was a, not, not enough time to, to get to everyone, but hopefully you get a chance to contribute at one of the later sessions. So now, very, very briefly, our uh, panel of speakers, note the fact I said very there twice, so, you know, I'm serious about it. Um, <laughs> If you could uh, give your thoughts on just what you've heard from the floor and, uh, and wrap up, that'd be great. Right, well, I, was, I was asked uh, two questions, I think. The yeah. uh, first one was over here in relation to the central bank um, rules. I have always sympathized with those rules, and I still do, really, because um, my preference would be get down house prices. And I think that unless you have regulations of that kind, that they brought, they brought them in on the demand side. People are always stressing the supply side, but if you, if you inflate the demand for housing, which you would by having no regulation, then people will pay more, and it, it just, in my view, doesn't work. So I would, my preference would be to reduce house prices. So I, I, would, I think they will probably tinker with them. They'll probably increase to 220 grand to 250 grand, something like that. But I think on balance, I think on the demand side, it is important to stop irresponsible lending and irresponsible borrowing. That's the reason people are in mortgage arrears today. They borrowed too much. They were inveigled by the banks to borrow, over-borrow. So, you know, while the knee-jerk reaction is, oh my God, that central bank shower, a crowd of bowsies, on balance, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Now, the second question relates to the same question, really, construction costs. And interestingly, I brought along uh, some stuff that uh, a private developer, Nolan, uh, is Hibernia Rice, actually, he's produced a set of costings, and I think they're overinflated. And he claims that it costs a developer 327,000 to build a house. Now, that includes a big profit of 38 grand. That's too much of a profit. 37,365, sorry. Too much profit. And it includes high professional fees, 10 grand per house. I think that's far too high. So these are inflated figures. Now, I have a separate, separate set of figures that I've done with a, a quantity surveyor in Wicklow, a highly respectable man. And he reckons that you can easily knock 40 or 50,000 off that price that Nolan has produced for the private developer. Now, 
gentleman over here raised the issue of the state building. The state can build and pay a site cost of about 50,000 per site and pay the VAT at about 220,000. So houses can be built by the state at a reasonable cost. They're not making a profit, of course. They're even paying VAT. There are ways of reducing the price of housing, as well as there are ways of reducing the rents by rent regulation. I yes. hope I've answered or tried to answer the question. That's great. Sarah Jane, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, I suppose I just wanted to kind of address that you mentioned uh, long term rent um, on, I suppose, mainland Europe. Actually, I was talking to a friend of mine whose family grew up in long term rented accommodation in Switzerland. And I think that is the road we need to go down, but there's a reluctance for people to want to do that without rent certainty. Um, but I, I personally would love that option and would love that to be normalised. Um, and I think it's kind of, you know, it's kind of geared towards young people. It's equality of access for young people or people with maybe not the huge amount of money that you need to be able to put a deposit down in the house, much like the other girl from Dublin Central there, the issue that you brought up, um, which I think is a huge problem. And I think maybe long-term renting um, and developing that culture might be the solution to us being able to access decent housing as young people. So that's all I have to say anyway. Sorry, I didn't mention land. It was already yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Land, absolutely critical. Must keep down the price. Okay, we'll give the final word to Catherine. Right, thank you very much. <clears throat> the, um, someone mentioned about our document outside and the language in starter home, homes. We'll have a look at that. But, uh, and, and a lot of the documents out there are there to whet the appetite for people to respond and to take them further. So please take them in that, that context. And I think it's stated on all of the, of the documents that's the case. But we should be building, um, we should be building housing in, we should be building communities. And the community should be about mixing the tenure, socially mixing the, mixing the, house, uh, the house type, size and all the rest of it. And there are things like homes that people will start in and uh, maybe move up as the family gets bigger and move back down um, as, their, as their needs reduce. If you build a community with that kind of philosophy, that it's a community that, is a, 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 that takes, across, uh, takes the whole lifespan uh, you know, uh, into, into consideration. And we need to start thinking of, of, of doing that. Part of the reason why people opt to buy in this country is because it, renting doesn't mean renting a home. It, men, no, it no. means renting somebody else's property. It means the lack of security of tenure. And it means, you, you know, the idea of being in the same home in 20 years' time is just, you know, unlikely to happen. And then, obviously, security of, of, of rent. That has to be an option, and it's a viable option for people. Uh, and for a cohort of people, uh, it will be the option that they would they would opt for. Um, we also need um, uh, we also need uh, people to build, and we need in our planning system we do need to address delays and cutting out risks, and that oh, deals yeah. with yeah. that yeah. deals. There's costs associated with those risks as well that we've got to come back from. And as Joe had said at the beginning, not cut people out from um, contributing to uh, more or less having their say on the community that they live in. But there are definitely, if you, if you, if you make something very uncertain, you increase the risks. If we look at, for example, a housing delivery agency, that, um, and it goes back to the point you talked about, about, uh, about uh, you know, a, a different uh, approach with a, tier, a housing association or a voluntary uh, association. There are plenty of those examples around the country, but the length of time it takes to, to, to deliver them is the problem. And that's why you need the focus on delivery, whether it's, um, pro it's a kind of a project management type approach. Um, and those kind of things can help to take uncertainty out. They're the kind of things that we'd like to see more of. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well done, <laughs> Folks, we're now moving on to a series of uh, parallel sessions. Um, the first one on repeal the Eighth Amendment has taken place in Liffey Hall 1, which is just as you go out the door. And the other four are all taking place in the meeting rooms. There's one on challenges for SMEs, Brexit and Sterling, transparency in politics and public life, revitalizing the re regions, and effective local campaigning. They're all in the meeting rooms where you would have voted. Meeting room one was where you voted. All of them are on that corridor. So you turn right as you come out the door, and it's around the corner. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good.